Good afternoon, everyone. Please be seated. Good afternoon. So I will start by thanking our President, Joe Biden, for his long-standing leadership in the fight to save lives from gun violence. I also want to thank my husband, the first, second gentleman of the United States, <laughs> and the extraordinary members of our administration, the members of Congress, survivors, advocates, and our incredible young leaders who raise their voice and demand change. So we are all gathered here today for a simple reason. We agree that in a civil society, the people must be able to shop in a grocery store, walk down the street, or sit peacefully in a classroom and be safe from gun violence. But instead, our nation is being torn apart by the tragedy of it all and torn apart by the fear and trauma that results from gun violence. Recently, I have met with students on college campuses across our country. And when I'm there, every time I turn to the students and I make a request of them. And what I ask is, please raise your hand if you have had an active shooter drill while you were in elementary or middle school. Every time, every time, a sea of hands goes up. Because in today's world, on the first day of school, students, yes, learn the name of their teacher. Yes, they learn the location of their cubby. And they learn how to quietly hide from an active shooter. In fact, when having this conversation, a student once told me, I don't like going to fifth period. Why, honey, I asked. Because in fifth period, there's no closet. In our country today, one in five people has lost a family member to gun violence. Across our nation, every day, about 120 Americans are killed by a gun. And while this violence impacts all communities, it does not do so equally. Black Americans are 10 times more likely to be victims of gun violence and homicide. Latino Americans, twice as likely. And as a former courtroom prosecutor, I will tell you I have personally prosecuted homicide cases. I have seen with my own eyes what a bu bullet does to the human body. We cannot normalize any of this. These are not simply statistics. These are our children, our brothers and sisters, our mothers and fathers. As a former district attorney, attorney general, and US senator, and now as vice president of the United States, I have grieved with parents who have lost a child. I have comforted children who have been traumatized by losing a parent or a sibling. We owe it to them and to those living in fear to act without delay. And on this issue, we do not have a moment to spare nor a life to spare. And here's the thing. Solutions do exist. It's a false choice to suggest you either have to choose between supporting the Second Amendment or passing reasonable gun safety laws. That's a false choice. President Biden and I believe in the Second Amendment, but we also know common sense solutions are at hand. So I'll close with just a couple points. First, President Biden and I continue to be deeply inspired by the students who are leading this movement. So many of whom are here. And second, in so many ways, we are then propelled by their work, by your work. And being propelled by what you are doing, we are expanding our work. 
With this new office, we will use the full power of the federal government to strengthen the coalition of survivors and advocates and students and teachers and elected leaders to save lives and fight for the right of all people to be safe from fear and to be able to live a life where they understand that they are supported in that desire and that right. And with that, I will now introduce a national leader on this issue. He was only 15 years old when he joined this movement. He is an organizer, he is an advocate, he is a coalition builder, and he is the first Gen Z member of the United States Congress. <laughs> Representative Maxwell Ross, there you are like this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It, it feels good to be a part of a winning movement. Good afternoon, and thank you, Vice President Harris, for the amazing introduction. It's the honor of a lifetime to be here today as President Biden submits his legacy, cements his legacy, as one of the fiercest champions of gun violence prevention. President Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris. I'm Congressman Maxwell Alejandro Frost, proudly representing Central Florida in the House of Representatives. As the youngest member of the United States Congress and first member of Gen Z, I'm often asked what got me involved in this work, and the answer is quite simple. I didn't want to get shot in school. I was 15 years old when a shooter walked into Sandy Hook Elementary School and murdered 20 children and six teachers. And like millions of kids, I went to school the next day with anxiety and fear that my life would be taken, my friends' lives would be taken, and my family's lives would be taken by senseless gun violence. Right before I was elected to Congress, I served as the National Organizing Director for March for Our Lives, a movement that inspired young people across the nation to demand safe communities. And we came together, every town, Brady, Newtown Action Alliance, Gifford, Sandy Hook Promise, Moms Demand Action, Change the Ref, the Community Justice Action Fund, and so many on the ground organizations that have been doing this work for decades. It's because of that steadfast, passionate organizing that we are a winning movement. But we're a winning movement doing very difficult work because the brutal truth is usually when the most people are paying attention to our movement, it's usually coupled with carnage and death, but not today. Today, the country sees us here at the White House with a president who is taking action. My very first bill as a member of Congress was to introduce the Office of Gun Violence Prevention Act of 2023. <laughs> to bring together a, coordinate, a, a federal coordinated response on this issue, and today, um, that bill and our ask as a movement will become a reality due to the executive action and leadership of President Biden and Vice President Harris. See, the president understands that this issue, especially for young people, especially for marginalized communities, is a matter of survival. He's a president who's been fearless enough to reject the gun lobby and sign into law the first major federal gun legislation passed in nearly 30 years, the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act. And look, this, this, this action and that legislation come from love. From Pulse to Parkland, we fight because we love. From Breonna Taylor to Trayvon Martin, we fight because we love. From Tiana Major, Joaquin Oliver, Jamie Gutenberg, we fight because we love. Because when you love somebody, you want them to live free of gun violence. That is what true freedom is. And President Biden wants that safety and freedom for every American. And if this week has shown us anything, because the White House has been very busy this week. It's that Joe Biden wants to be and is a president that understands the power of young people, a president fighting for the world that we deserve. Today, as this administration announces yet another piece of groundbreaking action in the fight to save lives, I am proud to introduce the President of the United States of America, President Joe Biden.
Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Everyone should see it except mom and dad. Mom and dad, stand up. I want everybody to see the parents of this proud, young, new congressman. You did a heck of a job. Congressman Frost, thank you for the introduction. And uh, you've helped uh, power a movement that's turning the cause into reality. You know, you're the big reason why I'm so optimistic about America's future. So many, so many engaged young people. So many engaged, I remember when I was young. We have something in common. I got elected to the Senate when I was 29 years old. The only difference was he was eligible when he got elected to take office. I had to wait 17 days to be eligible. That was 827 years ago, but it was a while. <laughs> Folks, Vice President Harris, members of the Cabinet, so many members of Congress who are here, and the relentless leaders on this critical issue. You know, uh, one of the members who couldn't be here today is a really important member, Senator Chris Murphy. With Chris, uh, who, uh, who together with Congressman Frost introduced the bill, created a dedicated gun violence prevention office, uh, he couldn't be here today. Since the tragedy in Sandy Hook, and I remember being there, I remember that uh, how I met with every one of the parents who were there. I met with every member, every family member. And what I do also remember is that uh, I remember as we were leaving, the state police doing the investigation asked the senator if they'd meet with me, if I could meet with them. And I said, of course I would. And I think there were about 12 to 14 of them. And I walked in a room, and two of them started crying. And they said, we need help. We need help. And I looked at them. I said, what can I do? They said, we need psychiatric help. We need help. We need help. Anyone who doesn't think that these kinds of engagements have a permanent effect on young children, in many cases, older their entire lives if they never had a bullet touch them, misunderstands. These were hard and tough cops asking me could I get them psychiatric help? To all the state and local leaders and advocates from all across the country, and to the survivors and families who are with us today, many of whom Jill and I have gotten to know. And by the way, our losses may be different circumstances, but I know events like this are really hard to attend. You want to be here to promote the change but it brings back all the memories as it happened a day ago. And I thank you, those of you who are parents, for being here, brothers, sisters, for being here. It matters. You have absolute courage. You found purpose in your pain. And because of all of you here today, all across the country, survivors, families, advocates, especially young people who demand our nation do better to protect all, who protested, organized, voted, and ran for office, and yes, marched for their lives. I'm proud to announce the creation of the first ever White House Office of Gun Violence Prevention, the first office in our history. Created by executive order, I determined to send a clear message about how important this issue is to me and to the country. It matters, and here's why. After every mass shooting, we hear a simple message, the same message all over the country, and I've been to every mass shooting. Do something. Please do something. Do something to prevent the tragedies that leave behind survivors who will always carry the physical and emotional scars. Families will never quite be the same. Communities overwhelmed by grief and trauma. Do something. Do something. Well, my administration has been working relentlessly to do something. To date, my administration has announced dozens of executive actions to reduce gun violence more than any of my predecessors at this point in their presidencies. And they include everything from cracking down on ghost guns, 
breaking up gun trafficking, and so much more. And last year, with the help, your help, I signed into law the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, the most significant gun safety law in almost 30 years. It strengthens background checks, expands the use of red flag laws, improves access to mental health services, and so much more. This historic law will save lives. It's a really important first step. And by the way, I was the guy, along with a woman in California, who also we once banned assault weapons and multiple magazines. We're going to do it again. We're going to do it again. Call to action, a reason to hope. Because for so long, the conventional wisdom was we'd never get any Republicans to support gun safety legislation. But we did. For the first time in three decades, we came together to overcome the relentless opposition from the gun lobby, gun manufacturers, and so many politicians opposing common-sense gun legislation. And we beat them. And we did it through a bipartisan effort that included a majority of responsible gun owners. We're not stopping here. Again, it's, I'll say it again. I'm not going to be quiet until we get it done. It's time again to ban assault weapons high-capacity magazines. If you need 80 shots in a magazine, you shouldn't own a gun. Because, look, Last time we did it, it worked. We also, last time, we established universal background checks to require safe storage of firearms. It's time. It's time. Look, while we push, we, we push for Congress to do more, we're going to centralize, accelerate, and intensify our work to save more lives more quickly. That's why this new White House Office of Gun Violence Prevention is what it's designed to do. It will drive and coordinate a government and a nationwide effort to reduce gun violence in America. And it will be overseen by an incredible vice president who understands this more than any vice president has. No, really. That's not hyperbole. That's a fact. She's been on the front lines of this through her entire career as a prosecutor, as an attorney general, and as a United States senator. Her deep experience will be invaluable for this office. And Steph, Where's Steph Feldman? Steph, I want you to stand up, please. Steph Feldman has been working on an issue with me since Sandy Hook in 2012. Now, she was 13 years old when she joined me, but <laughs> since 2012, we'll serve as director of the office. An office, and the office will have four primary responsibilities. First, to expedite the implementation of the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act and the executive actions already announced. And I mean it. We're going to fully implement them. Second, coordinate more support for survivors, families, and communities affected by gun violence, including mental health care, financial assistance, the same way FEMA responds to natural disasters. Same way. And helps folks recover and rebuild and alter. Look, folks, shootings are the ultimate superstorm ripping through communities. Third, identify new executive actions we can take within our legal authority to reduce gun violence. And fourth, expand our coalition of partners in states and cities across America, because we do have partners to get more. We need more state and local help to get these laws passed locally as well, and to strengthen our laws and give us more hope. Folks, to be clear, none of these steps alone is going to solve the entirety of the gun violence epidemic. None of them. But together, they will save lives. And it's going to help. It will help rally the nation with a sense of urgency and seriousness of purpose. Today, guns — I never thought I'd even remotely say this in my whole career. Guns are the number one killer of children in America. Guns are the number one killer of children in America, the United States of America. More than car accidents, more than cancer, more than other diseases. In 2023, so far, our country has experienced more than 500 mass shootings and well over 30,000 deaths due to gun violence. This is totally unacceptable. 
It's not who we are. And we have to act, and we have to act now. And let me be very clear. If members of the Congress refuse to act, then we'll need to elect new members of Congress that will act. <laughs> Democrat or Republican. Look, folks, there comes a point where our voices are so loud, our determination is so clear that our effort can no longer be stopped. We're reaching that point. We've reached that point today, in my view, where the safety of our kids from gun violence is on the ballot. At the end of the day, whether the Democrats or Republicans, we all want our families to be safe. We all want to go to school, houses of worship, grocery stores, gyms, malls, movies, without constant anxiety. We all want our kids to have the freedom to learn how to read and write in school instead of duck and cover, for God's sake. And it matters. So let me close with this. Earlier this summer, I was in Connecticut at a summit on gun safety hosted by Senator Murphy. Four students impacted by gun violence who are here with us today summoned extraordinary courage and stood and shared their stories on stage, four of them. They each came from different backgrounds, different parts of the country, different shootings. But they shared a common singular message that one of them summed up in just a few words, and I quote, the deadly and traumatic price for inaction that's what he talked about, the deadly and traumatic price for inaction. They made clear what all of you know too well. That price can no longer be the lives of our children and the people of our country. They spoke for an entire generation of Americans who will not be ignored, will not be shunned, and will not be silenced. And I know, I know progress is hard. I've been at this a long time, but we've done it before. We can do it again. If we're here, I'm here to tell you, to you and the Vice President Harris hears you as well. You're right. You're right. We're by your side. And we're never going to get up, you give up dealing with this problem. We're never going to forget your loved ones. We're never going to get there unless we remember. You know, I know we'll do this because I know you. Heroes. Heroes proving that even with heavy hearts, you have unbreakable spirits. In memory of your loved ones, you're building a movement that endures. Above all, you'll never give up on the one thing we must never lose, hope, hope, hope. Jill and I, Kamala and Doug, our entire administration are more determined than ever to carry forward that hope, that inspiration, that light that you continue to give us all. For the lives we have lost, well, for the lives we can save, we can do this. We just have to keep going. We just have to keep the faith. We just have to remember who we are. Every time I walk out of my grandpa's house up in Scranton, he'd yell, for real, Joey, keep the faith. And my grandmother would yell, no, Joey, spread it. Spread it. That's what we have to do, spread the faith. And remember, remember, and I mean this sincerely, we are the United States of America. There is nothing, nothing beyond our capacity when we do it together. Nothing we've ever tried to solve when we've done it together, we haven't succeeded. God bless you all. May God protect our troops and may God protect our children. Thank you so very much. Distinguished guests, please.